astounding stories twenty august nineteen thirty one the port of missing plains by captain s p meek part one so that's the port of missing plains mused dick purdy as he looked down over the side of his cockpit it looks wild and desolate all right but at that i can't fancy a bus cracking up here and not being found pronto gosh wilder crashed in the wildest part of arizona and he was found in a week the mail plane droned monotonously on through perfect flying weather purdy continued to study the ground recently transferred from a western run he was getting his first glimpse of that section of ill repute below him stretched a desolate almost uninhabited stretch of country by looking back he could see belfonte a few miles behind him but phillipsburg the next spot marked on his map was not yet visible twelve hundred feet below him ran a silver line of water which his map told him was little mooshannon run as he watched he suddenly realized that the ground was not slipping by under him as rapidly as it should he glanced at his airspeed meter what the dickens he cried in surprise for an hour his speed had remained almost constant at one hundred miles an hour without apparent cause it had dropped to forty less than flying speed he realized that he was falling a glance at his altimeter confirmed the impression the needle had dropped four hundred feet and was slowly moving towards sea level with an exclamation of alarm purdy advanced his throttle until the three motors of his plane roared at full capacity for a moment his airspeed picked up but the gain was only momentary as he watched the meter drop to zero although the propeller still whirled at top speed his altimeter showed that he was gradually losing elevation he stood up and looked over the side of his plane the ground below him was stationary as far forward progress was concerned but it was slowly rising to meet him he fumbled at the release ring of his parachute but another glance at the ground made him hesitate it was not more than three hundred feet below him i must be dreaming he cried the ground was no longer stationary for some unexplained reason he was going backward the motors were still roaring at top speed purdy dropped back into his seat in the cockpit with his ailerons set for maximum lift he coaxed every possible revolution from his laboring motors for several minutes he strained at the controls before he cast a quick glance over the side his backward speed had accelerated and the ground was less than fifty feet below him it was too close for a parachute jump as soon as i am falling i won't crack much anyway he consoled himself he reached for his switch and the roar of the motors died away in silence the plane gave a sickening lurch backward and down for an instant purdy again leaned over the side he was no longer going either forward or back but was sinking slowly down he looked at the ground directly under him a cry of horror came from his lips he sat back moping his brow another glance over the side brought an expression of terror to his white face and he reached for the heavy automatic pistol which hung by the side of the control seat he cleared belafonte at nine in the morning dr birds said inspector dolan of the post office department and headed towards phillipsburg he never arrived by ten we were alarmed and by eleven we had planes out searching for him they reported nothing he must have come to grief within a rather restricted area so we sent search parties out at once that was two weeks ago yesterday no trace of either him or his plane has been found the flying conditions were good perfect also purdy is above suspicion he has been flying the mail on the western runs for three years this is his first accident he was carrying nothing of unusual value 
are there any local conditions unfavorable to flying none at all it is much uninhabited country but there is no reason why it shouldn't be safe country to fly over there are some damnably unfavorable local conditions doctor although i can't tell you what they are broke in operative carnes of the united states secret service dick purdy was rather more than an acquaintance of mine after he was lost i looked into the record of that section a little it is known among aviators as the port of missing planes how did it get a name like that from the number of unexplained and unexplainable accidents that happened right there dugan of the air mail was lost there last may they found the mail bags where he had dropped them before he crashed but they never found a trace of him or his plane they didn't not a trace the same thing happened when mayfield cracked in august he made a jump and broke his neck in the landing he was found all right but his ship wasn't tierson of the army dropped there and his plane was never found neither was he he was seen to go down in a forced landing he was flying last in a formation as soon as he went down the other ships turned back and circled over the ground where he should have fallen they saw nothing search parties found no trace of either him or his ship those are the best known cases but i have heard rumors of several private ships which have gone down in that district and have never been seen or heard of since dr bird sat forward with a glitter in his piercing black eyes carnes gave a grunt of satisfaction he knew the meaning of that glitter the doctor's interest had been fully aroused inspector dolan said dr bird sharply why didn't you tell me those things well doctor we don't like to talk about mail wrecks any more than we have to of course the loss of so many planes in one area is merely a coincidence probably the wrecked planes were stolen as souvenirs such things happen you know fiddlesticks said dr beard sharply he raised one long slender hand with beautifully mottled tapered fingers and threw back his unruly mop of black hair his square almost rugged jaw protruded and the glitter in his eyes grew in intensity no souvenir hunting vandals could cart away whole planes without leaving a trace in that case what became of the bodies no inspector this has gone beyond the range of coincidence there is some mystery here and it needs looking into fortunately my work at the bureau of standards is in such shape that i can safely leave it i intend to devote my entire time to clearing this matter up the ramifications may run deeper than either you or i suspect please have all your records dealing with plane disappearances or wrecks in that locality sent to my office at once the post office inspector stiffened of course dr bird he said formally we are very glad to hear any suggestion that you may care to offer when it comes however to a matter of surrendering control of a post office matter to the department of commerce or to the treasury department i doubt the propriety our records are confidential ones and are not open to every one who is curious i will inform the proper authorities of your desire to help but i doubt seriously if they will avail themselves of your offer dr bird's black eyes shot fire idiot he said if you're a specimen of the post office department i'll have the entire case taken out of your hands do you mean to cooperate with me or not i fail to see what interest the bureau of standards can have in the affair the bureau isn't mixed up in it dr bird is if necessary i will go direct to the president oh thunder what's the use of talking to you who's your chief chief inspector watkins is in charge of all investigations carnes get him on the telephone tell him we are taking charge of the investigation if he bulks have bolton go over his head 
then get the chief of the air corps on the wire and arrange for an army plane to-morrow there is something more than a mail robbery back of this or i'm badly fooled do you suspect i suspect nothing and no one carnes yet i'll get a few instruments together to take with us to-morrow we'll fly over that section until something happens if it takes us until this time next year a three-seated scout plane rose from langley field at eight the next morning captain garland was at the controls in the rear cockpit sat dr bird and carnes inside his flying helmet the doctor wore a pair of headphones which were connected to a box on the floor before him carnes carried no apparatus but his hand rested carelessly on the grip of a machine-gun the plane cleared bellefonte at nine thirty and bore east towards phillipsburg captain garland kept his eyes on his instrument board and on a map less than six hundred feet above the ground he was following the air mail route as exactly as possible overhead a mail plane winged its way east three thousand feet above them fifteen minutes brought them to phillipsburg captain garland shot his plane upward a few hundred feet turn back captain said dr bird into the speaking tubes retrace your course a quarter of a mile farther north at bellefonte turn back and go over the same ground another quarter of a mile north keep flying back and forth working your way north until i tell you to stop the plane swung around and headed back towards bellefonte of course we can't tell exactly what route he followed said the doctor to carnes but he was new on this run and it's safe to assume that he didn't stray far we'll quarter the whole area before we stop carnes watched the ground below them carefully there was nothing about it to distinguish it from any other wooded mountainous country and his interest waned he glanced aloft the mail plane had disappeared in the distance and the sky was clear of aircraft he turned again to the ground it looked closer than it had before he turned and looked at the duplicate altimeter the plane had lost nearly a hundred feet elevation there's something wrong about this plane doctor came captain garland's voice through the speaking tube it doesn't behave like it should i guess we've found out what we're looking for carnes said dr bird grimly what seems to be the matter captain blessed if i know was the answer it felt like a drag of some sort like an automobile going through heavy sand we're slowing down though i am giving her all the gun i've got cut your motor said the doctor shortly he bent over the duplicate instrument board as the roar of the motor died away carnes rose and looked over the side look doctor he cried in a strained voice directly below them yawned a hole sixty feet in diameter and extending down into the bowels of the earth the plane hovered over the hole for a moment and then slowly descended into it what is it cried the detective it's the secret of the port of missing planes replied dr bird throw off your parachute keep your gun and light handy but don't fire unless i do first the same holds good for you captain the plane sunk until it was fifty feet below the level of the ground carnes looked up gradually the circle of sky became blurred and hazy as though the air were heavy with dust the rasp of dr bird's flashlight key aroused him and he hastily wound his own the haze above them grew thicker suddenly the light died and then came darkness a darkness so thick and absolute that it bore down on them like a weight dr bird's light stabbed a path through it they were in a tunnel or tube reaching into the ground the sides were smooth and polished as though water-worn the plane sank deeper and deeper into the earth suddenly dr bird's light went out what's the matter doctor asked carnes did your light fail no came a strained voice i turned it out why i don't know light yours 
Carnes reached into his pocket. Dr. Bird could hear his breath coming in panting sobs as though he were exerting his whole strength. I can't do it, doctor, he gasped. I want to, but some power greater than my will prevents me. Are you affected, Captain? asked the doctor. I can't move, came in muffled accent from the front cockpit. Some power beyond my knowledge has us in its grasp, said the doctor. All we can do is sit tight and see what happens. We are no longer falling at any rate. From the forward cockpit came a rustling sound. There was a slight jar in the ship, and it gave as though a weight had been applied to one side. "'What are you doing, Garland?' asked the doctor sharply. There was no reply. Again came the rustling sound. The ship gave a sudden lurch as though a weight had left the side. Carnes suddenly spoke. "'Good-bye, doctor,' he said. "'I'm going over the side.' I have been fighting it, but I'm going myself in a minute, replied the doctor grimly. Something is pulling me over. It's the same power that keeps me from turning on my light. It's perfectly safe to go over, said Carnes suddenly. The plane is resting on a solid base. I have the same feeling. Catch hold of my belt and let's go. They climbed over the side of the plane and dropped to the ground. Their descent made absolutely no sound. Dr. Bird stopped and felt the floor. Crepe rubber, or something of the sort, he murmured. At any rate, it's noise and vibration proof. Now what? asked Carnes. This way, replied the doctor confidently. I'm beginning to get the hang of understanding this. The way is perfectly level and open before us. Keep your hand on my shoulder and step right out. How do you know where we're going? I don't, but something tells me that the road is level and open. It is the same thing that brought us over the side. I can't explain it, but it's some sort of a telepathic control exerted by an intelligence. Whether the sending mine is reinforced by instruments, I don't know, but I rather fancy not. Where is Garland? He went off in another direction. I could feel the power that guided him, although it was not directed at us. Something tells me that he is safe for the present. For half a mile they made their way through the darkness before they stopped. This time Carnes could plainly understand the command which came to both of them. There is a table before us, said Dr. Bird. Lay your flashlight and pistol on it. Carnes struggled against the order, but the power guiding him was stronger than his will. He strove to turn on his light. When he could not, he tried to cock his pistol. With a sigh, he laid his gun and light on the table before him. Without words, the two men walked forward a few feet and sat confidently down on a bench that something told them was there. For a moment they sat quietly. A cry, choked in the middle, came from the detective's throat. Cold, clammy hands touched his face. He strove again to cry out, but his voice was paralyzed. The hands went methodically over his body, evidently searching for weapons. Mustering up his will, Carnes made a grab for one of them. His captor apparently had no objection to the detective's action, for Carnes seized the hand without effort, but he almost dropped it. The hand was as large as a ham. He reached out for the other hand, but could not locate it. A movement on the part of his captor brought it to him, and he made the startling discovery that the palms were directed outward. The hand had only four fingers, which were armed with long curved claws instead of nails. Carnes ran his hand up the palm to search for a thumb, but found none. He found, however, that, while the hands were naked, the wrists were covered with short, thick fur. Doctor, he cried, there's... Again came the overpowering will, and his speech died away in silence. He sat dumb and motionless while his captor moved over to Dr. Bird. A second animal came forward and felt the detective over. He was not allowed to move this time, nor was he while a third and fourth animal went carefully over him. The four drew back some distance. Doctor, whispered Carnes, as the influence grew fainter. 
was the answer and as the doctor demanded for silence it was reinforced by another wave of paralyzing power carnes had no choice as he sat there silent the power which held him again seemed to grow less he found that he could move his arms slightly he edged forward to get his gun in light before he reached them a beam of light split the darkness dr bird stood electric torch in hand staring before him at a distance of a few feet stood a group of half a dozen animals about the height of a man as they stood erect on their short hind legs they were covered with heavy brown fur their lower limbs were thin and light but their shoulders and forelegs were heavy and powerful their forepaws which had the palms facing outward were armed with the long wicked claws he had felt no visible ears protruded from the round skulls their heads appeared to rest between their shoulders so short were their necks their muzzles were long and obtusely pointed through grinning jaws could be seen powerful white teeth talipidae cried dr bird carnes they are a race of giant intellectual moles despite the fact that they had no visible eyes the creatures were strongly affected by the light they dropped on all fours and turned their backs to the scientist and the detective two of them scurried away down a long tunnel which opened from the room in which they stood dr bird turned his light up and swept the room it was roughly circular a hundred feet in diameter with a roof ten feet high dozens of tunnels led off in every direction your light carnes quick cried the doctor in a strained voice carnes reached towards the table for his light before he could reach it he was frozen into immobility from the corner of his eye he could watch the doctor dr bird was struggling to bring the light back on the moles which stood before them great beads of sweat stood out on his forehead inch by inch he moved the light closer to his goal but carnes could see that his thumb was stealing up towards the switch button his breath came in sobs suddenly the light went out for some time the two men sat motionless on the bench unable to speak or move one of the moles stepped forward before them and gave a mental command the two rose to their feet for a mile or more they followed their guide then at a silent command they turned to the right for a few steps and stopped in another moment the numbing influence had departed are you all right carnes yes right as can be doctor what were those things where are we what is it all about we'll find out in time i guess replied the doctor with a chuckle carnes isn't this the darndest thing we've ever been through captured half a mile underground by a race of giant talpidies before whose mental orders we are as helpless as children did you understand any of their talk talk i didn't hear any well mental conversation then they made no sound no all i understood was the orders i obeyed end of part one the port of missing planes astounding stories twenty august nineteen thirty one the port of missing planes by captain s p meek part two i got a good deal of it the doctor said we are evidently in or near a sort of central community of these fellows they spoke thought is a better word they thought of doing away with us but decided to wait until they consulted someone with more authority you see we are not airplane pilots captain garland was taken at once to the place where they have other aviators imprisoned what do they want of pilots underground i couldn't quite get that there was another thought that i am not sure that i interpreted correctly if i did there is some man of the upper world down here in a position of considerable authority among them he has some use for pilots but what use i don't know we are to be held until he is consulted who could it be i can only think of one man 
Carnes, and I hope I'm wrong. I don't have to name him. You mean? Ivan Saranoff. We haven't heard of him or had any activity from him for the last eight months. We know that he had a subterranean borer with which he had penetrated deep into the earth. Isn't it possible that he has, at some time in his explorations, come into contact with these fellows and made friends with them? It's possible, Doctor, but I hope we had killed him when we destroyed his borer. So did I, but he seems to bear a charmed life. Several times we have thought him dead, only to have him show up with some new form of devil's work. It is too much to hope that we have succeeded in doing away with him. Did you notice one thing? Those fellows were helpless while I held the light on them. The one which was holding us captive got so interested in the discussion about our fate that he momentarily forgot us. That was when I got my light. Until I turned the light away from them, we were free men. That's right, answered the Secret Service man, remembering that. The next time we get a light on a bunch of them, hold them in the beam until we can make terms. If we ever get hold of a light again, I have a light they didn't get, probably because they didn't think of it while they were around. It is one of those fountain pen battery affairs, and they probably took it for a pen. I won't turn it on now, partly to save it and partly not to let them know we have it. Let's see what our prison is like. They felt their way around the room. It proved to be eight paces by ten in size. Like the tunnels, it was floored with crepe rubber or some similar substance which gave out no sound of footprints, yet was firm underfoot. The room was furnished with two beds, a table, and two chairs. There was no sign of a door. That's that, exclaimed the doctor when they had finished their exploration. I'm hungry. I wonder when we eat. Hello, here comes one of the fellows now. Carnes made no reply. As the doctor's speech ended, a wave of mental power enveloped the room. One of the moles entered, moved over to the table for an instant, and then left the room. An earthly odor of vegetables pervaded the room. My question is answered, said the doctor. We eat now. He moved to the table. On it had been placed dishes containing three different types of roots. Two of them proved to be palpable, but the third was woody and bitter. The prisoners made a hearty meal from the two they relished. For an hour they sat waiting. Here they come again, exclaimed the doctor. We are going before the person I spoke of. Can't you get their thoughts? No, I can't, doctor. I can understand when I get a command, but aside from those times everything is a blank to me. My mental wave receiver, if that's what it is, must be attuned to a different frequency than yours, for I can hear them talking to one another. I guess I should say that I can feel them thinking to one another. At any rate, they want us to follow. Come along. The road will be open and level. The doctor stepped out confidently with Carnes at his heels. For half a mile they went forward. Presently they halted. We are in a big chamber here, Carnes, whispered the doctor, and there is someone before us. We'll have some light in a minute. His prophecy was soon fulfilled. A vague glimmer of light began to fill the cavern in which they stood. As it grew stronger, they could see a raised dais before them on which were seated three figures. Two of them were the giant moles. Each of the moles wore a helmet which covered his head completely, with no sign of lenses or other means of vision. It was the central figure, however, which held the attention of the prisoners. Seated on a chair and regarding them with an expression of sardonic amusement was a man. Above a high forehead rose a thin scrub of white hair. Keen brown eyes peered at them from under almost hairless brows. The nose was high-bridged and aquiline, and went well with his prominent cheekbones. His mouth was a mere gash below his nose. 
framed by thin bloodless lips the lips were curled in a sneer revealing yellow teeth the whole expression of the face was one of revolting cruelty so said the figure slowly fate has been kind to me my friends dr bird and operative carnes have chosen to pay me a long visit i am greatly flattered the thin metallic voice with its noticeable accent struck a familiar chord sarnoff grasped carnes yes mr carnes sarnoff professor ivan sarnoff of the faculty of st petersburg once now merely sarnoff the scourge of the bourgeoisie i hope we had killed you murmured carnes it was no fault of dr bird's that he failed replied the russian with an excess of malevolence in his voice his method was a correct one merely the fortuitous fact that we had just pierced one of the tunnels of the Siloam, and i was away from my boring exploring it saved me you did me a good turn doctor without meaning to you destroyed an instrument on which i had relied in doing so you unwittingly delivered into my hands a power greater than any i had dreamed of the Siloam. what can a mental cripple like you do with blind allies like them asked dr beard with a contemptuous laugh the russian half rose from his seat in rage for a moment his hand toyed with a switch before him the sardonic sneer came back into his face and he dropped back into his seat you nearly provoked me to destroy you doctor he said but cold calculation saved you since you will never return to the upper world save when and as i decree i have no objection to telling you the Siloam are not blind their eyes are under the skin as is the case with many of the talipidae but for all that they can see very well their eyes function on a shorter wave than ours a wave so short that it readily penetrates through miles of earth and rock this cavern is now flooded with it visible light the light by which we see is limited to their eyes hence the helmets which you see they can see through those helmets as well as you or i can see through air what do you intend to do with us ah doctor you hit me in a tender spot i have a sore temptation to close this switch on which my hand rests were i to do so both you and mr carnes would vanish forever i have however conceived a very real affection for you too your brains doctor working in my behalf instead of against me would render me well-nigh omnipotent mr carnes has a certain low cunning which i can also use to advantage both of you will join me you might as well close your switch and save your breath sarnoff for we will do nothing of the sort replied the doctor sharply ah but you will so will mr carnes i had no hopes that you would join me willingly in fact i am pleased that you do not i could never trust you all the same you will join my forces as have the others whom i have brought into the hands of the Siloam. i have ways of accomplishing my desires it pleases my fancy doctor to use your brains in aiding me in my scientific developments you will enjoy working with the scientists of the Siloam. among them you will find brains which excel any to be found on the surface of the earth since we too are below already i have learned much from them you mr carnes shall be taught to pilot an airplane when my cohorts go forth from the realms of the Siloam to establish the rules of russia you will be piloting one of the planes your first task will be to learn to fly i refuse to do anything of the sort said carnes i will not be ready to have your flying lessons started until tomorrow replied the russian and you will have until then to reconsider your rash decision 
it will be much easier for you if you obey my orders if you still refuse to-morrow you will pay a visit to the laboratory of the salon when you return your lessons will be started you will now be taken to your cell i have use for dr bird this afternoon i won't leave dr bird and that's flat exclaimed carnes dr bird interrupted him go ahead carnesy old dear he said lightly you might just as well toddle along under your own power as to be dragged along you have a day for reflection in any event i dare say i see you again before they do anything to you carnes glanced keenly at the doctor's face what he saw evidently reassured him for he turned without a word and walked away the light grew gradually dimmer until darkness again reigned in the cavern come doctor said sarnoff's voice we have work to do carnes sat alone in his cell for hours the darkness and the loneliness wore on him until he felt that his nerves would crack not a sound came to him he threw himself on one of the beds and plugged his ears with his fingertips in an attempt to keep the silence out then a cheerful voice sounded in the cell and a friendly hand fell on his shoulder well carnsey old dear said dr bird have you been lonesome dr bird gasped carnes in a tone of relief are you all right right as can be i learned a lot this afternoon for one thing you're going to start flying lessons tomorrow and you're going to do your best to become an expert pilot in a short time it is the only thing to do and fly a plane for sarnoff i hope not the only way to avoid that very thing is to keep you mentally unimpaired so that i can call on you for help when i need it if the salome operate on you you will be useless to me operate what do you mean i'll tell you the salome are a very old and highly civilized people for ages they have possessed scientific knowledge for which the upper world scientists are now blindly groping among other things they have a perfect knowledge of the workings of the brain if they operate they will remove from your brain every speck of memory you have of past events leaving only those things that will be useful to sarnoff you will be his complete slave in that condition you will be taught to fly a plane when the time comes you will fly one with no remembrance of anything which happened prior to the operation and with no will but his it will be easier to teach you flying in your natural state if you are willing you will be willing if you wish it doctor i do wish it most decidedly dr beard went on obey every order they give you you will find that the salom are a very enlightened and civilized race they are very kindly and would willingly harm no one then why have they taken up with sarnoff he is the first man with whom they have come into contact he has told them a horrible tale of conditions on the surface and they have swallowed it hook line and sinker they believe that he is going to establish a new order of happiness and plenty for all with the aid of his gang of cutthroats from russia if they had the slightest inkling of the true state of affairs they would turn on him in an instant why don't you tell them remember that i am a stranger here and he has poisoned their minds against me although the mind of an ordinary man is an open book to them they cannot read sarnoff's secret thoughts against his will they can't read mine either for that matter i am working in the laboratory and i will pick up a great deal when the time comes we will strike for our liberty and for the safety of the world did you learn sarnoff's plans yes he is gathering planes and pilots in the underground caverns of the salome when he gets enough he will bring men from russia to man the planes 
what could the united states or the world for that matter do against a fleet of hundreds possibly thousands of the best planes equipped with deadly weapons unknown to their science that menace confronts us as we must remove it to give you some idea of the power of the Salom, this afternoon sarnoff and i with one assistant opened a cavern in the solid rock three miles long and a mile wide and over six hundred feet in height three men how on earth did you do it two men and one mole we did it with a ray the secret of which only this salome and sarnoff know you have told me a disintegrating ray is an impossibility objected carnes it is this is not a disintegrating ray carnes either i am crazy or the salome have solved the secret of time the fourth dimension i haven't been able to grasp the whole thing yet what i think we did was to remove that rock a distance perhaps only a millionth of a second forward or back into time at any rate it ceased to exist yet they can bring it back unchanged at will that was the way they captured our plane they sent out a magnetic ray of such power that it stopped our plane in mid-air and brought it to the ground they removed the rock from beneath us and lowered us into the hole by reversing the process they restored things to their original condition all of these tunnels and rooms were made in that way i still don't understand how they did it i don't either but i hope to in time now let's go to bed it's late tomorrow you will start your lessons with captain garland as an instructor he won't know you for he was operated on this afternoon do your best to become a pilot when i get ready i want you with me in full possession of all your faculties the next morning the two prisoners separated and went to their duties in the cavern which dr beard had described captain garland was waiting beside the plane he had flown he did not know carnes but he still knew how to fly declining to enter into any conversation he started expounding the theory of flying to the detective carnes remembered dr bird's words and applied himself wholeheartedly for four hours they worked together at the end of that time the light faded in the cavern and carnes was led by an unseen guide back to his cell he threw himself on a bed and awaited dr bird's return i have learned a few more things about the salome said the doctor when he entered the cell several hours later we are in their largest community they have cities or warrens scattered all over the world each city has its own ruler but the whole race are ruled by an overlord or king who habitually lives here he is away visiting a community under northern africa just now but he will be back in a few days the salome are sincere in their desire to help the upper world they feel great pity for mankind in view of the conditions sarnoff has described to them when the king returns i plan to make a direct appeal to him in the meantime go on with your flying lessons how did you make out today the second day was a repetition of the first as were the third and fourth a week passed before dr bird entered the cell in evident excitement has hannock brought our evening meal yet he asked anxiously no doctor good take this light as soon as he enters throw the light full on him and hold him until i work on him we've got to make our escape why the king is due back to-morrow sarnoff is frightened at the good impression i have made on the salome he is supreme in the monarch's absence so he plans to operate on both of us before he returns he is afraid to allow me to see the king with an unimpaired intellect and memory Shh! here comes hannock the door to their cell opened noiselessly when the mole who brought their food was well inside carnes turned on the tiny flashlight the mole dropped on all fours and tried to turn its back 
dr bird sprang forward for an instant his slim muscular fingers worked on the mole's neck and shoulders silently the animal sank in a heap come on carnes cried the doctor turn off the light did you kill him doctor asked carnes as he raced down a pitch-dark corridor at the scientist's heels no i merely paralyzed him temporarily he'll be all right in a day or so turn here for ten minutes they ran down corridor after corridor carnes soon lost all track of direction but dr bird never hesitated presently he slowed down to a walk it's a good thing i have a good memory he said i planned that course out from a map and i had to memorize every turn and distance of it we are now behind your flying hall and away from any of the regular dwellings of the salome straight west about four miles is one of the time ray machines with a guard over it aside from them there isn't a mole between here and detroit what are you going to do doctor keep out of their way and avoid recapture if we can if we merely wanted to escape we would try to get possession of that time ray machine and open the road to the surface however i am not content with that i want to stay underground until astok their king returns when he comes we will surrender to him suppose they operate without giving us a chance to present our side of the affair if they do sarnoff wins but they won't the more i have seen of the salome the more impressed i am by their sense of justice they'll give us a hearing all right and a fair one for two hours the doctor led the way at the end of that time he stopped we've gone as far as we need to he said they'll undoubtedly send out searching parties but if we can avoid thinking they won't be able to find us the tunnels are a perfect labyrinth if you care to sleep go to it we'll be safer sleeping than awake for we won't be sending out thoughts so fast end of part two of the ports of missing planes astounding stories twenty august nineteen thirty one the port of missing planes by captain s p meek part three dr bird threw himself down on the rubber floor of the tunnel and was soon asleep carnes tried to follow his example but sleep would not come to him frantically he tried to think of nothing by an effort he would sit for a few minutes with his mind a conscious blank but thoughts would throng in in spite of him time and again he brought himself up with a jerk and forced his mind to become a blank the hours passed slowly carnes grew cramped from long immobility and rose a sudden thought intruded itself into his mind i might as well throw that light away he murmured to himself it will be no good now the salome won't hurt us if they do catch us he reached in his pocket for the light he was about to hurl it from him when a moment of sanity came to him he stared about the impulse to hurl the light away came stronger he strove in vain to turn it on doctor he cried suddenly wake up they're after us with a bound dr bird was on his feet the light he cried where is it in my hand murmured carnes with stiffening lips dr bird seized the light a beam stabbed the darkness less than fifty feet from them stood two moles as the light flashed on carnes regained control of himself take the light carnes snapped the doctor i've got to put these fellows to sleep slowly he advanced towards the motionless salome he had almost reached them when the light flickered out he turned and raced at full speed toward the detective carnes was standing rigid and motionless dr bird took the light from his hand despite the almost overpowering drag on his mind he managed to turn it on he swung the beam around in a circle 
besides the two salome he had seen before the light revealed a pair standing behind him as the light struck them the numbing influence vanished for an instant from the doctor's mind he moved a step forward and then halted the moles behind him were hurling waves of mental power at him again the light cleared him for an instant but he got a brief glance of other moles hurrying from every direction the jig's up i guess he muttered he strove to free himself by the use of his light but the tiny battery had done its duty and gradually the light grew dimmer the influence grew too strong for him with a sigh he shut off the feeble ray and hurled the light from him the moles closed in all right said the doctor audibly we'll go peaceably as he spoke the paralyzing power was withdrawn with carnes at his side he retraced the route he had taken from the cell before they reached it they turned off dr bird realized that they were treading the familiar path to the laboratory outside the laboratory the salome halted a wave of mental power enveloped the prisoners and they remained silent and motionless while their escort withdrew from the laboratory came three of the salome scientists as the laboratory door opened they could see that it was bathed in a flood of light and that the moles wore helmets covering their heads they moved inside clad in a white gown stood saranoff so my friends you would run away and leave me would you gloated the russian and just when i had planned a very beneficial operation for you i will remove permanently from your brains all the delusions which now encumber them and from your own puny wills i will substitute my own the power which had held the prisoners silent disappeared you have caught us saranoff said dr bird i know the power you wield and that you are making no idle boast i appeal however to these others my friends the operation you are planning to perform is not a routine one it is one that should have the sanction of the king before it is done i appeal from you to him he is far away laughed saranoff when he returns your plea will be presented to him but it will be too late to do any good you are right doctor i do not plan a mere routine operation not only will i remove your memory but i am going to use the time ray on you and banish forever into the unknown a portion of your brains without knowing which adjustment i make of the infinite number possible no one not even the king can ever recall it dr bird turned to the salome scientists and hurled his thoughts at them this man intends to commit a horrible crime he thought and one which he has no authority to perform to you i appeal for justice bid him wait until astok returns and let him be the judge as to whether it shall be done jumor you know me well you know that my brain is the equal of one of the salome even you cannot read my thoughts against my will are you willing to see that brain destroyed astok will be here soon and nothing will be lost by a short delay he thinks truly was the answering thought of jumor it would be better to wait we will not wait crash saranoff's thought into their consciousness he killed hanak when he escaped and his punishment shall be as i have decreed did not the king give me full power while he was away it is true that he ordered us to obey this man in all things dealing with upper world men thought jumor if it is true that he killed hanak his punishment is doubtless just i did not kill hanak returned the doctor he is paralyzed and will be all right in a few hours if he isn't already i demand that you wait until astok returns when an appeal is made to him no other may judge so say the salome law that is true replied jumor we will wait until the king returns we will not wait came saranoff's thought 
the king delegated to me his powers during his absence as far as all the world save the salome were concerned were it one of the salome appealing to the king i would be powerless before the appeal these are not bound by salome law and are not entitled to its benefits we will operate at once then you will operate alone retorted jumor i will not assist you i need none of your help thought saranoff asmos and kamol will you help me if you refuse i will report to astok that you have disobeyed and defied his chosen delegate we had better assist him jumor thought asmos astok did delegate his authority i am not of the nobility and i dare not refuse to help suit yourself asmos replied jumor i refuse to assist and will appeal to astok against him the third mold hesitated you are higher in rank than we are jumor he thought at length and like asmos i dare not resist him i hear the king give this upper earth man his authority while he was away i will assist and i will leave the room retorted jumor he moved to a door and threw it open at the threshold he paused and sent back a final thought i will appeal to astok our ruler i will send now a message to him to hurry home that he may judge between us the door closed behind him saranoff chuckled audibly good-bye carnes said dr bird sadly this devil can do all he says he can and more i'm sorry i brought you and garland into this mess oh well it can't be helped doctor replied the detective with an attempt at cheerfulness what is he going to do to us he'll have to use instruments for what he plans said the doctor ordinarily a routine mental operation is performed without the use of extraneous power the mind of the operator is electrically connected to the mind of the victim by means of thought waves the operator banishes from the mind of the subject such portions of his memory and mentality as he chooses he may then substitute other things in place of what he has removed any of the salome could operate on you but i doubt whether jumor himself could do it successfully on me without aid from power here come the instruments asmos and kamol took from the cabinet on the side of the wall what looked like a cloth helmet attached to it were a dozen wires which they connected to a box on a table the box was made of crystal and inside it could be seen a number of vacuum tubes and coils of various designs other leads led to a similar helmet which asmos placed on sarnoff's head a heavy cable ran to a switch on the wall as kamal closed the switch the tubes in the box began to glow with weird lights violet green and orange streamers of light came from them to dance in wild patterns on the laboratory walls for five minutes saranoff made adjustments to the dials on the front of the crystal box the colored lights died away and a gentle golden glow came from the apparatus he threw off the helmet kamal left the laboratory and returned with a large coil on the top of which was mounted a parabolic reflector a device like a clock on the front of the coil was constantly marking the passage of time the dial had two indicators which were together saranoff chuckled you may not have seen this device work doctor he said in order to let you know what you are facing i will demonstrate he turned the reflector so that it bore on the wall he adjusted the moving dial so that the two indicators were no longer together as he closed the switch the wall before the reflector vanished saranoff turned off the power that portion of the wall has gone back in time exactly three seconds he announced as far as the present is concerned it has ceased to exist 
it is following us through time three seconds behind us but in all eternity it will never catch up unless i aid it since the exact time is known it can be restored if i were to alter this adjustment ever so little it could never be recalled watch me he again closed the switch this time in a reverse direction the wall instantly filled up as it had been before he moved the time dial so that the two indicators coincided after i have sent a portion of your physical brain into the past or the future as the fancy strikes me i will change the adjustment of that dial since there are an infinite number of adjustments to which i might have set it the chances that anyone could ever duplicate my settings and restore it are a complement of infinity or zero he said i am now ready to remove your memory if the impossible should happen and your physical brain be restored it would be useless asmos adjust the helmet i will operate on my friend the doctor first carnes strove to rush to dr bird's assistance but he was helpless before the force of Kamol's will asmos adjusted the helmet to dr bird's head and buckled it firmly in place with an evil grin sarnoff donned the other helmet good-bye dr bird he said mockingly you will continue to see me but you won't know me except as your master his hand reached for the switch it had almost closed on it when sarnoff stopped convulsively he sat motionless while the laboratory door opened and jumore entered the room he was followed by another mole the newcomer was fully six inches taller than the others his head was hidden by a helmet but around his arms he wore strings of sparkling jewels ivan saranoff what means this his powerful thoughts dominated the room i was merely engaged in rectifying some of the mental errors of this man of the upper earth explained the russian eagerly it is merely a routine operation such as you gave me authority to perform an operation which uses power is not routine replied the king i am told that this upper earth man has a brain equal to those of my most advanced scientist i am also told that you plan to do more than rectify his mental errors you have been falsely informed i was merely about to adjust his memory then what means this the king pointed to the time ray machine that was brought here in order that it could be used when you returned thought the russian eagerly this upper earth man killed hanek when he brought him food the door opened and hanek entered oh astok objected hanek's thoughts when these upper earth men had me at their mercy with a the light they spared me they paralyzed me for a time so that they might escape but they did it in such a manner that no harm came to me so jumer told me replied the king release them in an instant carnes was on his feet removing the helmet from dr bird's head the doctor struggled to his feet dr bird thought the king can you communicate with me easily yes your majesty but may i ask that you alter the vibration period of my comrade mr carnes he cannot understand you with his present low period the king stepped to the box with which sarnoff had been working in response to his commands the helmet which had been on dr bird's head was placed on the detective the king made a few adjustments to the dials and signaled for the helmet to be removed can you understand me mr carnes he asked mentally the question leaped with startling clearness in the detective's head carefully he framed his answer i can understand you said the king i will now sit in judgment on the appeal made to me dr bird tell me your story with eloquent thoughts dr bird poured forth the history of the upper world he told of the great war and the collapse of the russian monarchy 
he traced history to the fall of the moderate party and the rise of the bolsheviki he described the horrible conditions existing in russia at the end he reviewed the long battle he and carnes had fought against sarnoff when he had finished the king questioned carnes the detective repeated the story in different words and the king turned to sarnoff from the russian's mind came a tissue of distorted facts and downright lies he denied or twisted around everything that the detective and the scientist had said when he had done with his tale astok sat in secret thought for a few minutes the tales you tell me are so far apart that i can give credence to none of them he announced at length there is but one solution although they are never used for the salome have forgotten the meaning of a falsehood we have instruments which will drag the truth from the brain of the liar they are powerful and their use may easily be fatal if a man gives forth the contents of his brain willingly the process is not painful if he tries to conceal anything it is torture will you willingly submit your brains to the searching of this instrument gladly came dr bird's thought and carnes re-echoed it and you ivan saranoff demanded the king i will not submit thought the russian sullenly you will be examined whether you submit willingly or not replied astok i am going to learn the truth though i kill you all to get it at the king's order jumar hastened from the laboratory he returned in a few minutes with an apparatus similar to the one which sarnoff had planned to use on dr bird but larger and with more dials on the crystal box at a command from the king dr bird donned the helmet the king manipulated switches and dials around dr bird's head glowed a halo of crimson light twice an expression of momentary pain passed over his countenance after half an hour astok cut on the power and nodded to carnes don't try to hold anything back carnes he said dr bird sharply you couldn't if you tried and the process is very painful i can assure you with the helmet on his head the detective sat for ten minutes while the salome king went through his brain a dozen times he shrieked in agony but his moments of suffering were short the king removed the helmet your minds agree well he thought now i will examine the mind of my friend the helmet was strapped on sarnoff instantly an expression of the utmost anguish crossed his face shriek after shriek of agony came from his writhing lips relentlessly the king applied more power the cries of the russian grew heart-rendering suddenly he grew rigid and slumped forward in his chair astok impassively manipulated his instrument after half an hour he opened the switch and removed the helmet under the ministrations of jumar the russian revived the king sat in secret thought for an hour i have examined the brains of all of you he announced at length and i find hopeless contradictions each of you believes thoroughly in his own social order both tell me of hopeless misery on the part of a large portion of his people both tell of the horrible wars and suffering beyond my comprehension the thoughts of all of you teem with modes of bringing death to your fellow beings your entire science has been perverted to the ends of destruction nothing of this sort can be realized by the salome where truth justice and mercy prevail each of you holds that his form of government is better than the other and will cause less suffering and misery than the others none of you hold out hope of happiness for your fellow beings i do not know which system is less obnoxious my decision is made the salome will not interfere in the affairs of the upper earth you may fight out your battles without aid and without interference 
i will operate on both ivan saranoff and dr bird and i will remove from their minds all knowledge of our signs and instruments and leave them in the same condition that they were in when they entered my realms each of you will then be returned to upper earth ivan saranoff to russia dr bird and mr carnes to the united states the pilots whom i hold prisoner will have their mentalities restored and be returned to their homes the planes we have captured i will send off into time so that they can never be used for the misery of upper earth men again jumor you will carry out these orders i wish i could remember how that time machine was built and operated said dr bird reflectively as he sat in his private laboratory in the bureau of standards some time later but jumor did his work well i can't even remember what the thing looked like well doctor our trip below wasn't a loss we removed a very real menace to the established order of things and we have got rid of saranoff temporarily it will take him some time to return here from russia three weeks or less said dr bird pessimistically however we have gained one other thing did you notice this he pulled what looked like a watch from his pocket carnes regarded it with a puzzled expression no doctor what is it it is a very small camera which takes pictures one half inch by seven eighths i had several opportunities to use it i wasn't sure that it would work on such short waves but it did when saranoff tries to return to this country he will find that every immigration inspector and every member of the border patrol has an excellent likeness of him that may hinder his entrance into the country for a little while end of part three and the end of the story of the ports of missing planes